As every aircraft approaches touchdown, there's a system that's about to be put to a critical test. An aircraft's braking system can perform under extreme conditions. Here at takeoff speed, with the engines on full throttle, despite the huge forces, the aircraft efficiently slows in a straight line. On every landing, the braking system must perform efficiently enough to soak up and dissipate the energy, preventing the plane from going off the end of the runway. The system must be balanced too, or the aircraft could veer off the tarmac and perhaps go out of control. Tom, the braking systems on road vehicles need to perform in a similar way to those on aircraft, don't they, but under less extreme conditions? Yeah, they need to control the speed of the vehicle and bring it to a stop efficiently without actually affecting the direction in which it's pointing. Now, we're going to look at brake performance in the MOT test, but first, let's have a look at the brakes on this aircraft. Now, Tom, this is a, a substantial bit of kit, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. Fantastic. It's a disc brake assembly. It's got a massive caliper with 14 pistons per caliper per wheel. Dual hydraulics, it's an ABS system, it's a power brake system. The pilot controls the service foot brake with the rudder control in the cockpit, but it has a fully automated braking system. So before touchdown, they can feed in the data, such as the weight of the aircraft, the length of the runway. And when these wheels touch the tarmac, that system takes over and applies just the right pressures at the right time. So perfect braking performance every time. Perfect. Well, we better get on with the main event and go to a test station. I've got a vehicle lined up at our new training centre at Chatterton, so we'll, we'll go there. Perfect. Yep. Well, here we are in the test bay, Tom. Uh, I imagine, though, there are some things that we need to do before we can get started. Yeah, the first thing you need to consider is the equipment. So whether you're using a roller brake tester, a plate brake tester or a decelerometer, you need to consider, is it approved equipment? Is it calibrated? Is it in good working order? And then, of course, you need to consider the vehicle. Now, for this brake performance test, we're using a roller brake tester. So now we need to consider the vehicle. Can it be used on a roller brake tester? Now, there's such vehicles as permanent 4x4 drive and belt-driven transmission vehicles. These are more common vehicles and easy to identify. When you're doing the underside inspection, it's a good time to check. For example, vehicles that have got a, a mechanical servo. Um, such a vehicle as Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud One. Well, when you're under, underneath the vehicle, you can clearly see that on the offside of the gearbox that component's fitted there and the rod's coming from it. Um, limited slip diff, um, the Jaguar XJS V12, some had limited slip diff, some didn't. When the tester has the rear of the vehicle jacked up, if they rotate one of the rear wheels by hand, the other wheel will go in exactly the same direction at the same speed. And so how would you actually test those vehicles? Those vehicles will be tested on a plate brake tester or a decelerometer. And we'll come to those later, won't Yes, we? we will. Does the vehicle's condition matter? Yes, that's very important. This is why we advise that a full inspection is carried out before you do a brake performance check. Um, and the tester would be looking for defects that may damage the vehicle, may damage the equipment, may cause injury. I've got a defect here that you might be interested in looking at. This is a disc brake. Oh, yeah. See quite clearly, it's what you might call a cracker. So you obviously wouldn't carry out a test in those circumstances? No, that's quite right. And the tester would be looking for such things as underinflated tyres, excessively corroded brake pipes, um, frayed brake cables, those kind of defects. Now, we love dates, don't we? And you've got a rather good one. Yes, I do, yeah. Um, vehicles that are certified by the London Science Museum and are designed before the 1st of January 1905 don't need to have a parking brake. But that brings me to another point. When we consider uh, unusual vehicles, uh, such as vintage vehicles, or vehicles designed with controls for use by disabled drivers, on such vehicles, the presenter should be allowed to operate the controls during the brake performance checks if they want to. So does that mean that under normal circumstances, we need an assistant? 
No, we don't normally need an assistant, but there may be circumstances when we do. For example, if the gauges are in a position where they cannot be easily read, then we'd need an assistant to operate the controls, and the tester would stand by the gauges and read the gauges. But because it's easier when you're doing a video, I've got a VI colleague here today, Ian Marsh. Morning, Hi, Ian. Hello, Robert. I'll be controlling the rollers, and Ian will be following my instructions. Uh, now, you've got uh, a rather good way of describing uh, what we're looking for here, haven't you? Yes, yeah, so, uh, um, we talk about aspects of brake performance, six aspects, in fact. A low effort, clearly indicating the brake isn't functioning correctly on any wheel. This is a defect in its own right, and it's worth noting it shouldn't be confused with out of balance or rate of increase or reduction. Then there's brake efficiency, brake bind, severe grab or severe judder, rate of increase and reduction, and finally, out of balance. All right, this uh, vehicle's uh, ready to go. Shall we get in to put it on the uh, brake tester? Not quite yet. Because we've not done the rest of the test, uh, and this would apply to a tester who may not have done the underside inspection yet, we need to be satisfied that the tyres aren't underinflated, and we need to identify whether it's a single or dual hydraulic braking system. Why do we need to know if it's a dual system? Because that affects um, the decision on the part brake percentage. And how can testers tell if it's a dual system? That's simple, they just look at the master cylinder. If there's a single pipe coming from it, then it's a single system. And if there's at least two pipes coming from it, it's a dual system. Right, what we're going to do now is I'm going to pick up my disc and then we're going to go over to the gauges um, and then we'll get the vehicle in the roller set. Okay. Right, now we're at the roller brake tester console and there's certain things we're going to need to consider before we actually operate the roller brake test machine. For example, if the vehicle were automatic transmission, such as this vehicle, then it mustn't be in the park position for obvious reasons. If it has a servo fitted or if it's a power brake system, then the engine must be running. Um, so if there's an enclosed space uh, and there's exhaust extraction equipment, such as we have here, and that's available to test it, then they should use it. OK, right, Ian, before we do anything else, make sure it's in neutral, please, and all the brakes are off. Now, why do the brakes need to be off? The brakes need to be off because that's how it would be in normal use. And then it could be that if the pipe brake were applied, it may enhance the service brake performance. I understand. One other thing, tester needs to consider if it's necessary to chock the wheels that are not in the rollers. Certain vehicles react quite violently when they're in the roller set. Um, and we've got a very good view of the uh, gauges here, haven't we? Yes, we have. Uh, normally, uh, the tester and myself, I'd be in the vehicle operating the controls, but um, I'm going to work them from here, so I will actually control the brake rollers. I'm going to have to line up the vehicle. OK, and now... We're going to run each wheel up independently and measure the brake force on the service brake. So I start with the near side roller. OK then, Ian. Slowly apply the service brake right through to maximum. You can watch the increase here on the gauge gradually going up. That's fine, and we've taken to a point where either we get the maximum figure or the wheel's locked. OK, brake off. Thank you. OK. So now we're going to operate the offside wheel. OK, slowly apply the foot brake through again, please, Ian, to maximum. And it's coming right up through. Thanks very much, and the brake off. So that's completed the maximum readings for the service brake, and we now know at which point the slip will occur. And, Tom, you'll record these results? Yes, I will, in the point at which they lock, because I'll need them for the calculations later. So 330L, 360L for lock. Now, something I'm a bit confused about, uh, this uh, car has ABS, so how come the wheel's locked? Oh, that's a good point. The speed at which the, the brake rollers operate is slower than the speed at which ABS is activated. And ABS we covered in an earlier video, Breaking News. I remember that. Now, why do we need to know when the wheels have locked? Um, it's important for when we're 
carrying out the calculations on brake efficiency, um, there is an allowance that if more than half the wheels lock in any braking system, then we don't actually have to calculate the efficiency. We assume the, the requirement is met. And what if we don't get the required number of wheels locking? Well, in that case, we have to do the calculation. What we're now going to do is we're going to run both rollers together when we apply the, the service brake. Yep, so I'll just start them up. Firstly, I'm just watching while the, the brake's not applied, just seeing the readings on the gauge. All right then, Ian, slowly apply the service brake, please. Gradually increase it. And more. Now slowly release. Bring him right down to rest. OK, and break off, please. Now I shut down the rollers. Now the first thing we were considering is when the rollers are, are operating and the brake's not applied, do we have any figure recorded here, any significant figure that may indicate that there is a brake bind? Now when you're talking about brake bind, you have to consider such things as the weight of the vehicle. So for example, if this were a very large car, heavy car, you might have a, a reasonably high reading because of the weight of the car or because of such things as transmission drag. But if it were a smaller car, like a Metro, you would expect a, a much smaller reading. So a high reading on a big car would, would be meaningless, but that same reading on a small car as a Metro could be a problem. So we're considering that. And then as he takes them up through the range, yeah, we're then considering, is there grab? Do any one of the brakes suddenly come on? Yeah. Um, and it would be a severe grab we'd be considering. We'd also be looking for reactions on the needle, heavy fluctuations that would indicate severe judder. And we're comparing the readings as they go through for the rate of increase. Are they moving at about the same rate? And then we get to that point before slip occurs, and then gradually release, and now we're checking the reduction, either reducing about the same rate. And throughout that whole process, we're also considering the readings of one gauge against another to consider is there an out of balance happening at any time on the increase or on the reduction. So what do you do if you do start getting some wheel slip before you get high enough readings? If that circumstance occurs, then you stop and repeat that part of the process again. And what do you do if the vehicle has a park brake that operates on the front wheels? Oh, well, that's fine. We would then carry out the park brake performance check while those wheels are in the rollers. Um, this vehicle doesn't. Uh, the park brake's on the rear. So now we're going to move the vehicle forward and we'll check the rear wheels. Now we're at the point where the rear axle's in the roller set, so first thing. Ian, make sure it's still in neutral and all the brakes are off. We're going to have to line up the vehicle once again. So run both rollers, allow it to settle. And now we go through the, service, the second part of the service brake sequence. Run the near side roller. Now slowly apply the service brake, Ian. Go to a point where we get the maximum reading or, or lockout occurs. Yeah, so we've achieved that. OK, break off, Ian. Now apply the offside. Slowly apply the service brake, Ian. And the same thing again. OK, service brake off. And now I record those readings. Now we're going to run both rollers together, as we did on the front, yeah? OK. Slowly apply the foot brake. Slowly release, break off. Thanks very much. So that's completed the service brake check now. So Tom, what are the reasons for possible rejection so far? This brings us back to those six aspects that I spoke about. On the rear wheels, we apply only five of those aspects. We do not apply out of balance to the rear wheels on a service brake. So how do we know if the brakes are out of balance? There's a formula for that, and when we do some of the calculation work, I'll explain that formula. It's very easy. So do we do the parking brake next? Yes, we do. So all the brakes are off, are they, Ian? Run the near side roller. 
And slowly apply the pipe brake through to maximum, please. Thank you, and off. And again, slowly apply the pipe brake through to maximum. And off. I'll just record those figures. On the pipe brake, we only apply reason for failure on two of the aspects. Is there a low brake, brake effort that clearly indicates the brake's not functioning on any wheel? Or have we not met the brake efficiency requirement? Tom, how do you test uh, transmission pipe brakes? Right, when you're considering vehicles transmission pipe brakes, one of the first things you must think about is you really must chock the wheels that are not in the roller set because they can react quite violently when the brakes are applied. And then you'll run both the rollers together and we always make sure that the pull is disengaged when we apply the handbrake and you really mustn't forget to do that when, you, when you're testing these type of vehicles. And then you slowly apply the pipe brake until you get a high reading and then slowly release the pipe brake making sure that you avoid any transmission pipe brake snatch. Now a tip that's worth considering is that before you carry out this test, get the weight of the vehicle and calculate how much brake force you need to achieve to meet the minimum requirement. And then go through the process applying the pipe brake until you just reach that figure and then release the brake. And that will make the process flow much easier. Now we've completed the actual brake performance checks. And has it passed? Yes, it has. OK, it may have passed, but uh, what would have happened uh, if the wheels hadn't locked? If they hadn't locked, we will need to carry out the calculation, and that's what we're going to do now. Tom, many people use calculators like this one. How's it used? Right, very simple. On the outer scale is the vehicle weight, and on the inner scale is the total brake force. So if we say, for example, the vehicle weight were 1,000 kilos, and the total brake force came to 500 kilos. Just check that that's accurately lined up there. And we read off on the red scale down here, 50%. That's very straightforward. Very simple, but ours isn't going to be that straightforward. A more complex calculation to do. But before we do any of that, we need to get the weight of the vehicle off the data weight chart, which is over here. And so if we come down here in the vehicle we've been testing, there's its uh, make and model, and there's its actual weight. And that is a weight used uh, for brake performance checks, and it includes 140 kilos um, for driver and fuel and so on. What I've got here is I've got some typical figures that would have been generated during a brake performance test, and we're going to use those for calculation purposes. So what percentage are you looking for, Tom? Right, we've used a vehicle that's got service brake operating on four wheels on a dual braking system and the pipe brake operates on two wheels. Now the minimum requirement for the service brake is 50% and this would also apply to three wheel vehicles except those that are used before the 1st of January 1968. The minimum requirement for them is only 40%. Now on the pipe brake, if a vehicle had a single braking system then the minimum requirement would be 25%. But on this, it's a dual braking system, so the minimum requirement is 16%, OK? Now, I've got some typical figures here, and these are the ones we're going to use for calculation, as I've said. What we have here is we have a total brake effort, 645 kilos, and the vehicle weight is 1,190 kilos. And we divide the brake effort by the vehicle weight, gives us a figure less than 1.54, multiply it by 100, 54%, and that would be a pass. Now, some machines will actually calculate this for you, won't they? Yes, they do. And what about the park brake? On the park brake, it's on the two wheels. We've got some typical figures here. Total brake effort, 375 kilos. The vehicle weight of 1190 kilos. We divide the brake effort by the vehicle weight. Gives us a figure less than 1.31. Multiply it by 100. 31%, and that's a pass. And what are the fail criteria here, Tom? Well, we'd be considering, is the brake efficiency too low? And in the last page of the brake section of the inspection manual, all these figures are laid down.
Now, there are a few things that testers need to know about Class 7 vehicles, aren't there? Yes, there are, and one of them is design gross weight. Design gross weight is the weight of the vehicle plus the maximum design load weight. And this information can be found on the manufacturer's plate or on a ministry plate if it's fitted. And some Class 7 vehicles are going to come in empty, aren't they? Yes, they do. And sometimes there's an experience called premature lockout and the figures might not be achieved. This can be due to load sensing valve or pressure reducing valve reaction. So how would a tester apply all this? Okay, well firstly, if more than half the wheels lock out in any system, efficiencies are considered to be met. But let's say we had a two axle class seven vehicle. If both the front wheels locked out, all we need to achieve is at least 100 kilos on each of the rear wheels. Or if it were a three axle, class 7 vehicle, and both of the front wheels lock out, and all we need to achieve is at least 50 kilos on each of the rear wheels. Now earlier we talked about brakes being out of balance, and you said you had a calculation. Yes, um, it's quite simple really, um, all we do is we take the figures at a moment in time, the highest out of balance variance. So we've got 100 kilos on one wheel, and 150 kilos on the other wheel, and we take lower figure away from the higher figure which gives us 50 kilos difference. We divide that 50 kilos difference by the higher brake effort. That gives us a figure less than 1.33, multiplied by 133%. And what's the fail criteria? Fail criteria is they must not exceed 25% variance at any time. And what happens if a vehicle just passes on the percentage? What should a tester do then? then the tester should advise the presenter, you know, that may need adjustment or repair. Now, we've been using a roller brake tester. What about the others? Well, now it's time for us to go for a trip in a car, Robert. OK. <laughs> now, fortunately, here at Chatterton, we have a dedicated track for carrying out this type of test, and we use the flat bit at the far end of the track, but most testers would have to use the public highway, and they would need to make sure that they used a section that had good surface, that was suitable in wet or dry conditions, and it had a minimum of traffic. So where's the decelerometer? Uh, well, I've got some various ones in the back of the vehicle here. I'll just show you this. No. Oh. Now this one is, uh, well, state of the art, really. It provides a printout. Um, this particular one is a quite commonly used one in testing stations. But I'm going to use this device here, which is a small lightweight. Decelerometer. So there are a number of decelerometers that are approved by VI? Yes, there are, and the testers just need to make sure that they follow the manufacturer's instructions. OK, shall I get in the back? No, um, the tester, normally when we carry this test, there'd only be the tester in it, so that's the way we're going to do it today. And we've got mini cameras in there to film exactly what I'm doing when I'm inside. OK. I've got the decelerometer placed in the footwell and it's set to go. We take the vehicle up onto the flat section, getting up to a speed of approximately 20 mile an hour. I gently hold the steering wheel so I've got control of it, and I apply the brakes under controlled condition. I then can record the reading that's on the decelerometer. Nicely done, Tom. Same process yep. for the parking brake? Yeah, I'm going to do that right now. Okay. So once again, I've got the decelerometer set to go, and it's in the footwell there. Take the vehicle up onto the flat section, approximately 20 mile an hour. Now I apply the park brake. Note the reading that's on the decelerometer. And that's the job completed. So Tom, what are the fail criteria? Well. First of all, the brake efficiencies will be given as a reading on that meter. There's other things to consider. Um, it could be uh, grab or judder, um, and that would be felt as a heavy vibration on the steering wheel or the brake pedal. Uh, now, this is not an emergency stop. This is a controlled brake stop. So we would not be in any way activating an ABS system. So it would be nothing to do with that. Um, we need to consider a severe pull on the steering or if the vehicle uh, swerves appreciably. So it's as simple as that? It is as simple as that. And now we're going to go and look at the plate brake tester. So if you'd like to hop in, okay. we'll get going.
So, Tom, this is the plate brake tester. Is the preparation for this uh, similar to the roller brake tester? Pretty much. You'll need to know if it's a single or dual braking system. You'll need to get the weight of the vehicle from the data chart. Um, and this particular equipment actually calculates the performance for you. And what about Class 7 vehicles? Because they're not on the chart. No, they're not. On the Class 7, you'll need a design gross weight to calculate too. Um, and that you can get from either a manufacturer's plate on the vehicle or a ministry plate. Now, when you're using a plate brake tester, if the actual weight of the Class 7 is 2,000 kilos or more at the time of test, then you'll calculate against that design gross weight. If it's less than 2,000 kilos actual weight at the time of test, then you'll use a nominal design gross weight of 2,600 kilos. Now, I see that uh, you've got Ian in the car. Do you actually need an assistant for this? No, you don't. For the purpose of the video, it makes it more practical so that we can stand by the console over here and assess the readings. OK, and what's the procedure then for this test? Well, the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go to a safe place out of the way of the vehicle and stand over by the console. OK. Now we're well out of the way. All right, then, Ian, bring it forward. He's driving across at approximately four miles per hour, applying light, constant pedal pressure. OK, that's fine. Now, if you take it right back, that's the first run. And what we've measured here on the service brake is judder. And the results are now recorded in the machine. And I'm going to just change mode. On the second run, we'll be measuring brake bind, rate of increase, out of balance and efficiency. So what about the park brake? And the park brake will we'll, we'll carry out another run, a third run, and I'll just reset the motor park brake. OK, we're ready up for the park. All right, then, Ian, if you bring it forward, please. Four mile an hour. And as the wheels get onto the relevant plates, he applies the park brake, and now we've got recorded that figure. OK, if you could reverse the vehicle off the plate brake tester. So we've now got stored in here all the information we need. OK, let's have a look at those results. All right. Well, what we've got here on the screen is we've got a summary, a brake test report. It gives us the brake forces produced at each wheel on the service brake and also for the parking brake. It gives us the imbalance that's recorded for the front steered road wheels. And at the bottom here, it gives us service brake efficiency, in this case 98%, and parking brake efficiency of 39%. If you were dealing with a vehicle when you're on a plate brake tester and any of these aspects fail, then you have to run the vehicle across again to satisfy yourself that, you, that, that it is really a failure. And, and then, of course, that information will be recorded on a VT30. And you can print off a document here showing all these results, which is a good practice. Tom, how do they test the brakes on an aircraft for performance? Ah, well, when we were at the aircraft hangar, I was asking one of the engineers just that. He was explaining that in, in the hub of each wheel, this transducer, which measures the speed, and they have a, a motor that they apply to that, and it spins it up, and then they apply the brakes uh, and the various brake pressures, and they measure the efficiency and the Im imbalance, etc., without the aircraft ever turning a wheel. It's a very neat way of doing it, isn't it's it? It's really good, isn't it? <laughs> For further information, call the VI helpline on this number or log on to their website.